Good morning, if you're here on the uh, East Coast as I am. Welcome to another episode of Global Class Struggle. And a good afternoon if you join us from where the guest is uh, or anywhere in uh, Europe. We're here to unpack uh, a renewed effort at regime change backed by all of the usual suspects in Syria. How does this impact what is happening in Palestine, in Ukraine, and beyond? After this uh, introduction, we'll bring up Jody Brar to break all of this down with us. I sure if Hazard is a hard man to be, I share if is his only plan. He digs through pockets, takes what he can, for he. Greetings, greetings, and uh, welcome to our uh, comrade, uh, Jody. Uh, good to see you. Uh, how are you feeling today? Hi, Danny. I'm good, thank you. Very nice to be with you. So last time I uh, saw you, I'll, I'll just give some of the uh, background here. Uh, we were here at a massive um, concert in Nairobi, um, in a, in a in a very working class community, I, I thought it was super beautiful how they brought us uh, in uh, with the masses. The the buses barely fit through the uh, narrow corridors of that uh, popular uh, neighborhood. But maybe we'll start off in uh, Kenya, uh, where we were about roughly uh, two weeks ago. Um, what should people know about Kenya? What did what did you learn in in in, in Kenya? I mean, I guess from my perspective, the, the kind of signal thing to understand about Kenya is that it was a British colony and it wasn't a kind of purely a formal colony. Uh, the British established settler colonialism in Kenya. So they brought British white settlers to come and uh, take the best farming land and set up agricultural businesses in Kenya. They also brought when they needed to build infrastructure they brought laborers from another part of that empire, India, to build that infrastructure there. So particularly famous is the, a big railway line that was built at the turn of the century by um, Indian labor uh, that was brought over and then left there, settled there. So they created a, a very specific type of apartheid system, very similar to what you saw in South Africa with a kind of three tier society uh, with the British at the top, or Europeans, followed by the Indians and the Africans displaced, dispossessed, 
and very much at the bottom of the entire social pile. Um, and through my contact with um, Kenyan comrades, as well as through my own studies over the years, I've learned a few useful and important things about the Kenyan liberation struggle. Uh, for example, the, uh, the very earliest contact they had with socialism and with trade unionism came via the Indian uh, settlers in Kenya that the British had brought and dumped there. Um, and this was something that happened in a lot of places around the British Empire, particularly through, for, for some reason, the Sikhs, the, the British had seen the Sikhs as their kind of loyal um, puppets. So that they were, they were a, a part of the population in India that were one of the last to be conquered, but tended to be uh, good soldiers for the British after that time. So they saw the Sikhs as their kind of loyal henchmen, and they consequently took them all over the empire. And then those very same expatriate Sikhs became the conduit for revolutionary sentiments coming back into India, but also into other parts of the British Empire. So the, our Kenyan comrades celebrate, for example, the contribution of a, a guy called Mukan Singh, who was the first Kenyan trade unionist. And he was one of these Sikh railway workers that we were talking about. Uh, so that was really interesting that our Kenyan comrades also celebrate uh, the theoretical contribution to the socialist end of the national liberation struggle of a Goan Indian called Pio Gamapunto. We went to his grave together, didn't we? Um, and they named their educational institute after him. And I always I like to see these connections because it reminds us very much that you know, the empire, while it tries to control all the outcomes and manipulate all the people to do its bidding, it in the end, it's creating its own grave diggers with everything it does. You know, the fact that it was Indians who were given a privileged position over Africans and who were seen as loyal workforce were taken to Kenya, but then ended up being a conduit for trade unionism, for socialism, for these kind of ideas into the in, into the African population, and that together they the um, Indians and Africans worked for national liberation. Um, you, here's something interesting I discovered when we were here uh, just this time. Of course, most of your viewers will have heard of the Mau Mau. That was the name the British gave to the Land and Freedom Army, which was their liberation movement in the 1950s and 60s, an armed guerrilla movement. And they fought a really bitter um, war because the British suppression of that movement by, I might add, a Labour government in Britain was very active in suppressing the national liberation struggle in Kenya. And it was a, a really vicious suppression camp campaign they waged against it. There's been a, a book written, I forget the name of her author, of the author, her name, uh, called Britain's Gulag, that looks into the details of the basically genocidal suppression of the Kenyan liberation struggle, concentration camps, you know, beheading and mass murder of native peoples and fighters to try to stop the advance of the liberation struggle and they couldn't do it. But one thing I discovered was that um, um, a very great leader of that um, land and freedom army of the Mau Mau, oh, my brain's dead and... Ah, Kimati. Dead and Kimati. <laughs> Sorry, silly moment. Dead and Kimati. Well, I discovered he had dreadlocks. And when I looked at the statue of him and saw that picture, I was like, why does he look like a raster? And then uh, my comrade said to me, no, the, this is the part of Africa where the rasters took that style from. So I never knew that before. That was a really interesting new fact. And it sort of explains to me why there, there is this connection between Kenya and Rastafarianism and Ken, Kenya and rag, reggae music. And that festival that you and I went to, Danny, it was a reggae festival. And I found that really interesting and, and slightly surprising. Very beautiful introduction. All the internationalist uh, connections. Uh, we'll just show the statue of Dedan Kimati that you uh, referenced. Uh, this is where we had some of the uh, demonstrations in solidarity with Palestine uh, against imperialism. And um, let let's pivot uh, to um, Syria. Um, if 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 we look at the uh, mainstream headlines, let, let's see what's what's CNN, the truth-telling CNN, 
always reliable. <laughs> so CNN, uh, one of their headlines today, once we get through the Huggies ad, Syrian rebels capture second major city as army withdraws from Hama. Uh, Hama, this is where uh, the province where uh, Aleppo is, the second biggest city. And if you read through the imperialist mouthpieces, Jyoti, they would have us uh, believe that this is a purely um, homegrown, uh, righteous, natural resistance to the strong man, to the most horrible human being on earth, of course, after uh, Vladimir Putin. Uh, break, break down for us the imperialist messaging and what's behind all of these headlines. I mean, what we're seeing in the headlines, of course, is narrative construction, which it seems to be these days the main skill of the imperialists. You know, they have Hollywood, they have this huge machinery of creating Hollywood style narratives that people have been kind of conditioned to recognize and, and go along with. Um, but it's pure, it's pure fantasy, isn't it? Um, anybody who's paid any attention over the last, goodness, what is it now? For, 13 years, becoming up to 14 soon, um, since the West began its um, invasion, jihadi invasion. You know, they use a proxy army, like they've been using a proxy army um, in Ukraine. But ISIS, Al-Qaeda, um, SDF, what's the one they've got at the moment? Um, I forget its name. It was the TSN. That's it. Al Nusra, TFA. So all of these organizations are creatures of the West. They are made up of mercenaries and uh, brainwashed, um, you know, poor people who've been picked up from all over the world and brought together, trained um, using Gulf money, Turkish intelligence, Israeli intelligence, British intelligence, American soldiers. Uh, a combination of these forces have been training, arming, equipping these um, these forces, this proxy army, um, these jihadi death squads, Wahhabi death squads, to, you know, the Wahhabism, the Islamism that they profess, it's like the Nazi uh, ideology, the Banderist ideology of the Ukrainian forces. It's the way that they're ideologically motivated to act as imperialism's pawns in this area. So it's exactly the same strategy. It's the same strategy that's used for the Israeli people. They're given a Nazi ideology, an ultra-nationalist Zionist ideology, you know, that tells them they're the chosen people, they're doing the work of God and they're given guns, you know, and given pay to act as imperialist proxies in the region. Well, this is another one of those armies, basically. And this um, latest, offensive in Syria, we saw that it was time to coincide with the quieting of the front in Lebanon. And, um, you know, there's supposed to be a ceasefire, but in fact, it seems that only Hezbollah has to cease firing. Israel continues violating the ceasefire every day. But there's a, there's a somewhat diminution of the fighting on that side, at least. And as soon as that ceasefire agreement had been made, this new front opened up in Syria. And uh, I don't think it's an accident, that timing, but it's not something that was just decided yesterday. You know, an operation like that has to be in preparation for a long time. It's a bit like the Kursk invasion. You remember the Kursk invasion uh, in Ukraine, from Ukraine into uh, Russia, that again was was greeted with a huge fanfare and and a whole narrative was constructed around it like this is this great big push and it's incredible what they're what they're achieving and they've occupied swathes of russia and nobody explains that it's empty forest is what they have occupied and when you say occupied you mean kind of spread out in and got lost in and after that essentially the whole thing stalled and then they're being slowly rounded up and mopped up by the Russian army. Well, I think we're going, it looks like we're seeing something similar in Syria in terms of the, the narrative versus reality that you get this big push and a whole load of headlines and a whole lot, they've taken this city, they've taken this city, 
But what the Syrian side is saying, well, yes, we were taken by surprise and we've retreated to protect our lines. Um, but now the, you know, the Russians are, are in and, and bombing from the air the positions of the jihadis and um, the Syrian army is fighting fiercely. And they say, we haven't left these towns that the, the, the narrative, uh, the Hollywood narrative says, you know, Al Qaeda or whoever it is supposed to be has taken Homs. Um, had taken Hama, taken Aleppo, whatever. Um, and the Syrians are saying, no, that isn't what's happened. Um, we are fighting and we have every reason to believe that this is going to be a short-lived offensive and we will take back and liberate all the territory that's been taken in this offensive. Um, but, you know, obviously it takes a little bit of time to do that. And meanwhile, the the West does its best to make maximum use of that time for their headlines and their narrative construction. But I think for me, the thing that I looked at when I saw this operation, well, two things. Number one was I thought that it's a real, actually it's a sign of, of desperation for two fronts of the imperialist war. They're desperate about trying to save Israel and they want to extend the war to try to wear down the axis of resistance from a different direction because trying to wear it down from the Lebanese direction, uh, although they've inflicted huge civilian dam damage, and they've no doubt they've, they've inflicted damage on Hezbollah with all of those attacks, assassinations and pager attacks and all the other things, you know, those were heavy blows, but they weren't turning the tide in Israel's favor. The Israeli forces were getting really worn down uh, and exhausted up in Lebanon. So the imperialists are desperate to try to save the settler colony and they know that they've got to somehow bring the axis of resistance down in order to do that. So they, you know, they've turned to another front and they're trying to give um, the Israeli army a bit of breathing space, I think. But there's something else, I think, on the war front that we're seeing, which is this desperation to keep extending Russia. We know, don't we, the RAND Corporation, was it, brought out their study 2019, that, and they explicitly said their strategy for bringing down the government of Vladimir Putin and turning Russia into a US colony is to extend Russia, light fires all along its borders, everywhere it has an interest, and just try to keep so many of its forces busy that it just becomes, you just bleed it to death kind of slowly. And somewhere in that process, the Russian people get so upset that they rise up and get rid of their government. And then, you know, the US comes marching in. So I think we can't see the Syria offensive as purely directed at, is, uh, at saving Israel. I think it's also directed at, at Russia. Um, because these war fronts are essentially connected. It's, it's, it's one big war of the imperialists to try to retain their hegemony. And they try to present it to us as all separate conflicts when really it's not separate conflicts. Um, yeah, I th there was something else I was going to say, but I forgot it. Yeah, I I imperialism is showing an incredible flexibility. Uh, they have their uh, G side. Uh, against the Palestinians. They have certain tactics um, in Lebanon, whether it's blowing up uh, pagers across the country and all of that terrorism. Uh, in Syria, they have this proxy war. They wipe their hands clean as though the Saudis and the Turkish intelligence departments are somehow not uh, involved. Uh, with Iran, it's been a slow, long campaign since 1979 of, of sanctions and the disinformation war. Um, and uh, thank you for connecting uh, all of that. That's so important. I think it'll be helpful to uh, for everyone to see just the map of this uh, geography, um, because I think a lot of Americans think that Syria is so far from Russia, but you can see that Syria is not far at all uh, from Georgia, from Azerbaijan, these, these different countries that were part of the uh, Soviet Union. Uh, this is the only place in the world that Russia has uh, military bases outside of their own uh, territory or the former uh, Soviet um, uh, countries or, or, or territories. Um, republics would be the, the correct word. Whereas the United States has more than uh, 800 to 1,000 bases spread across the world, uh, 28,000 
troops uh, in, in South Korea. Uh, we see stuff uh, popping off in, in, in South Korea <clears throat> with a, the, the neoliberal president there just declared uh, martial law. The people rose up um, against this. And this is also a war of coordination. Uh, what Zionism and capitalism are saying is that the Iranians don't have a right to talk to the Syrians. Syrians don't have a right to talk to their neighbors in Lebanon. They don't have a right to coordinate any type of resistance against all these different uh, forms of uh, terrorism. Uh, I'll just show some of the other headlines and then pass it uh, back to you uh, here. Um, that's the wrong one. What they're trying to spin here is that uh, this this is going to help. Um, this is going to help the um, war in, in in Ukraine. Can Syria crisis provide a lifeline to Ukraine? That's Newsweek. Uh, openly flaunting, Russia accuses Ukraine of aiding rebel groups in Syria. Has Ukraine helped the Syrian rebel offensive in Aleppo? So it, there's reports that. There's some Ukrainian units that have somehow entered into to Syria. Is there any truth behind that? I don't know personally. It wouldn't surprise me at all. Um, we're seeing, it's really interesting, isn't it? Because one thing these narrative merchants have a tendency to do is project. So very often the crimes they accuse their enemies of are the things that they're up to. Um, all their dirty, you know, they've got the mindset of dirty tricks and underhand dealings. They have the mindset of seeing all their proxy armies as basically interchangeable and sending them wherever they might be needed. So, you know, they they um, train Uyghur Muslims uh, from, you know, Xinjiang in China to be jihadis. And then when that um, struggle or, or that um, terrorist effort is beaten, they rescue as many of their jihadis as they can from the chance of having a decent life in China and send them off, you know, bring them to Libya, a bit more training, then send them off somewhere, Africa or the Middle East or Ukraine. You know, they turn up all over the place, these people. And we're seeing, we, we've seen British Pakistani Muslims uh, as part of these forces in Syria. And I'm sure you will see the same people in Ukraine and wherever the, the US wants to send them. And when they gave this massive story about how there's a 20,000 North Korean troops in Kursk, and that's why that's why Ukraine can't win there. Um, actually, it was pure projection because they were starting to bring South Korean troops, South Korean army, of course, being another one of their proxy forces that's under US control completely. Um, they were bringing South Korean soldiers in because they're having a real problem filling the ranks of the Ukrainian army. Too many have been killed, too many have deserted, too many have run away. There simply aren't enough young people. That's why we see all these blaring headlines about the need to lower the um, conscription age. Uh, they're desperately ordering every uh, every able-bodied you know young person should be carrying a gun. You know, they just, they don't care how many people they throw into the mincer, Danny, do they? And it really makes me think of World War One. You see that the mindset of the imperialists towards the masses has not changed one tiny bit for all of the change in their presentation. Their mentality is exactly the same. They don't care how many people they throw in front of a machine gun, you know, to get to the top of the next hill. For them, it's all worth it. As Madeleine Albright famously said, the price is worth it. If you step, get a step closer to your goal to wear down Russia, we don't care how many Ukrainians we get rid of. And if we if we run out of Ukrainians, well, don't worry, there's Lithuanians, there's Latvians, there's Estonians, there's, there's Poles, you know, there's a whole load of other people we've been softening up with anti-communist, Russophobic, um, you know, propaganda for the last 30 years. And, you know, maybe we'll be able to to, to pile them in next. And we also have got jihadis we've been, you know, conditioning around the world. We've got South Koreans, we've been filling their heads full of, you know, fascistic nonsense. So, and Taiwan, you know, we've got these proxy armies and we're going to throw them in where we can. And we think of them really as interchangeable. I just wanted to come back a little bit uh, on, the, on the Middle Eastern situation, because I do think there's a couple of things that we should take notice of. You know, that pager attack, yes, it was imaginative. Yes, 
uh, I mean, it was a classic bit of underhand nastiness, right? Very indiscriminate attack because most of the people it hit were not people who ever put on combat fatigues and pick up a gun. You know, Hezbollah operates a whole load of social services, you know, hospitals and care homes and all that sort of thing. And it was mostly those type of people who were attacked with the pages. But of course, you know, it's a big blow to Hezbollah, the organization and all of the services it delivers that that happened. A lot of people killed and injured. And then, of course, the assassinations. But the pager trick in particular, that's a one off and they've blown it. And I think they blew it too early, to be honest with you. It, it was too early to shift the tide of the war in Lebanon. It didn't cause the disarray they were hoping because that's not actually how the Lebanese military communicate. From what I understand, Hez not Lebanese military, sorry, Hezbollah, but they basically are Lebanon's military, aren't they? From what I understand, Hezbollah built their own bespoke fiber optic communication network a long time ago, which is closed. And, you know, the imperialists can't get into it and they don't have access to it. So the pages didn't touch that. Um, and having having shown that, you know, they laid the basis for that um, operation 10 years ago. That's been 10 years in the making and now it's blown and they can't really do it again. Right. It was a one off attack. They blew it. It didn't have the effect they wanted. It didn't turn the tide of the war. Lebanon has not caved. Hezbollah is not destroyed and they can't do that operation again. Everyone around the world has gone hmm, where are we getting our equipment from and how are we getting it and what's the supply lines? And they're all throwing away anything that they can't vouch for and go to China and say, can we have some new stuff, please? Right. So that particular operation, OK, it was underhand, it was clever, whatever, but it's it's done. And you see the same with, with quite a few other things. I, I look at Turkey's role in this latest attack in um, Syria and you say, well, Turkey's... It was so stupid for the Turkish bourgeoisie. And it shows you how much in hock they must be to the Americans because they've done a really good job for a long time of, you know, <laughs> trying to sit on two horses and persuading the people of the East and the people of the global South and the majority countries of the world that they might be able to join them whilst trying to also stay in with the Americans. And Erdogan's been seen as kind of clever because he he bargains that each side off against one another. But with this attack at this moment, what it shows is Turkey and Turkish intelligence have been involved in preparing this attack for, for months. And it was launched when the Zionists wanted it launched. And all of that blows a cart and horse, horses through all the efforts of Turkey to try to face two directions. I think they've really blown it uh, finally blown it with Syria, finally blown it um, with uh, Russia. It's going to take an awful lot, I think, for any BRICS country, Iran, to, 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 to seriously have a conversation with Turkey ever again and think that there's, you know, it's, it's words worth the paper it's written on. As they had that long process of discovering with the imperialist countries, now, you know, Turkey has kind of exposed itself, I think, in a really short-sighted way. This offensive is going to be is going to be reversed. I don't think, it, again, it's not going to be decisive. It's a pain, but not as much of a pain as to like decisively shift the balance of forces in the Middle East and save Israel. Um, but it has destroyed Turkey's chance of continuing to, to face both ways, I think. And I think that the Turkish ruling class is going to regret that. And I think, it, like I said, it really shows how much in hock to the USA the Turkish ruling class actually is for all its attempts at trying to present itself as independent, you know, because everybody knows that Turkish intelligence is up to its neck in this operation. And, you know, so, of course, you know, all the Russians, the Iranians, everyone in the Middle East knows that and there's no way, it, you know, that can be avoided. It's going to be interesting to see how all of this um, plays out. Uh, the numbers are, are climbing where we're getting closer and closer to a thousand people live who are joining us. Hit the like button. Help us break the algorithmic uh, suppression so we can get Jyoti's voice out in the voice of the Communist Party of Great Britain that's done great ideological work now for years. I think we're all uh, indebted to them on, uh, on on multiple fronts for their uh, work. And share this, share this. I, I want to share this with my family members because the narrative merchants would would never mention that somehow it's our taxpayer dollars that are responsible for Ukrainian death. 
uh, that the Russians are the ones on the defensive, not on the offensive? And could it really be that uh, Jody and myself, we've dedicated our lives to dissecting imperialism and not just interpreting it, but trying to fight it and, and overthrow it? Could we really be this wrong? And CNN could be uh, that right? I think not. Um, you used a term there that, that's interesting, right? And it's another one of the things that we just blindly accept here in the um, uh, West, the Lebanese military, the Palestinian military, there's no such thing. They're not allowed to. <clears throat> so there has to be these grassroots efforts. Of course, uh, we've never heard one kind word in the West about Hezbollah. We're told these are the you know, worst people on, on, on earth. <clears throat> and what imperialism is doing harkens back to a century ago. They can take their mercenaries from one country and throw them into whatever conflict where they need to buttress their forces. So the example that was very close to us, we just came from Nairobi and the Kenyan comrades uh, taught us that uh, William Ruto, who's one of these bought off uh, lackeys of imperialism who masquerades as the president of the Kenyan people, widely unpopular, uh, 69, uh, student leaders and protest leaders were gunned down this summer, barely a headline in Britain or the U.S. about this, because as Noam Chomsky and Chris Hedges teach us, right, there's worthy victims and there's unworthy victims. So the the, the manipulation of, of, of the narratives is amazing. The Kenyan government then has sent their mercenaries to Sudan, to the Congo, with all of the, 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 we just saw Joe Biden in Angola. He's not going to Angola because he cares about the Angolan people. We know that much. And of course, the most notorious, at least from our perspective here in the US, and that is the reoccupation, the reinvasion, led by Kenyan mercenaries of, of Haiti. What, if we look at this through a historical timeline, because um, I remember the French Empire would use Senegalese troops in, 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 in other uh, you know, French colonies. But historically, how does this all line up with this uh, use of mercenaries in the global class struggle? I think, you know, the, the ruling class very much sees, well, the imperialist ruling class very much sees the world. And they even wrote that book, didn't they? There's a big new, I can't say his name. <laughs> It's a big new uh, about the grand chessboard, right? And before that, there was the great game between the British and the Russians in Afghanistan. Um, they look at the world as their chessboard. And what that means is they see the world's people as their pawns. They don't consider us as actors in our own right, the masses of the people, even the, the majority of nations. They don't consider to be on their level to be worthy of respect to be to be worthy of consideration they see everything as you know according to how they want to to machinate and manipulate and that if you throw enough money you can uh, and you know you back it up with your weapons you can basically things will work out the way you want them to do now of course these plans are constantly falling apart because precisely because they underestimate the ability of the masses of the people and the poor uh, oppressed nations of the world to learn and respond and develop their um, tactics in response to the way that they are treated. And sometimes these lessons take a long time. Sometimes these, you know, it's painfully long. You look at the Middle East, for example, you were just talking about Lebanon. You know, Lebanon doesn't have a government um, and it doesn't really have a state a state that's functioning. All these things have been torn apart over years and years. But Lebanon as a country is a is an invention of imperialism after World War I. In fact, most of the Middle East, you know, the lines were drawn on the map based on secret agreements made between uh, France and Britain during World War I and based on really making sure that they could continue to manipulate and control the region. So um, you, you separate, for example, if you look at one of the things, you know, because the, the Middle East is home to the, the greatest reserves of oil in the world, and that oil became very important to the, to the empires just before World War I. And suddenly the Middle East became interesting in its own right. 
rather than, you know, for the British, they, they had Aden as a port on the bottom of Yemen uh, because it was on the sea route to India. But the landmass of the Middle East, you know, Arabia was just seen as sand and kind of empty, you know, with a few camel jockeys, who cares, right? When they discovered oil there, the Middle East in, in itself became geopolitically a vital thing to keep hold of and manipulate. And when you look at the map of the Middle East, you see so many of the countries are oil wells with flags. And, you know, the, the, the way of dissecting Arabia was to, as far as possible, get the, keep the, the centers of population away from uh, where the, the biggest oil wealth was and, and not to have any country that would be able to be too powerful as an independent state following independence, so say. And, you know, they were all given monarchies. Um, a, a family, the Hashemite family, was um, kind of allocated to be the stooge monarchs of all these different kingdoms that were set up. So, so countries were created and they were given monarchies. You know, they were Hashemites. That was actually a Saudi family. But there, there was a there was a Hashemite king in Egypt. There was a Hashemite king in Jordan. There's still there were and one in Jordan. There was one in uh, Syria, I think, Iraq. Um, so they put all these kings in, and the people had to fight to overthrow these stooge regimes and try to get some kind of sovereignty. Lebanon was part of Syria. Um, should be reunited with Syria. If you talk to a Lebanese or Syrian communist, they will. They recently. Um, uh, celebrated the 100-year founding of their party, and it was one party because Lebanon and Syria is one place. Um, so the whole concept of Lebanon uh, as a separate place, you know, has been totally manipulated by imperialism, and they keep control of it by having sections of the population, you know, they've created a kind of communal politics. So they've actually created a, a constitution whereby the president has to be from one community, the prime minister from another one, the speaker of the house from another one. There's allocations of seats in the parliament based on religion. Um, it's very famous that in Lebanon, there's a group of Christians, um, oh, I've forgotten their names, I don't know how that can happen to me, uh, but who've collaborated with Israel, who committed massacres against uh, Palestinians, uh, famously in the Sabra and Shatila camp in 1982. Um, you know, so this was how they kept control of the region. The, and of each, the phalanges, thank you. Of each particular uh, country within the region and the region as a whole was to create all these divisions and create narratives about how Sunni and Shia can't live together. You know, they did exactly the same in India. Hindus and Muslims can't live together, you know. Um, Sunni and Shia can't live together. They're totally different. Alawites, they're different. You know, you, 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 you create these narratives and you give little privileges to different groups in order to create tension and, and um, uh, conflicts within the masses themselves and ally some of them to you and keep them basically fighting against and suspicious of one another. Um, I can't remember if I've answered your question. <laughs> no, that was great. Yeah, that, that covered a, a lot of uh, ground. Um, yeah, I mean, Kuwait, Kuwait's cut out of Iraq. They use that as a justification for war in 1991. Um, yeah. The United Arab Republic, which only existed for a few years, united Syria with Egypt. So that sentiment of pan-Arabism, uh, though not all people in the quote unquote Arab world are of course Arab, you have all this different uh, diversity. But you have half a billion people, uh, native people to these lands, watching a G side uh, play out a word here in the West, the Democratic West. We're not even allowed to say. They now tell us the words that we can say and and not, and it's getting worse and worse. So that brings us to this lame duck, uh, Joe Biden, uh, a wet hen, if there ever was one, to use another historical. Uh, metaphor. Um, Joe Biden has 45 days uh, uh, left. Uh, Trump, of course, has said that he wants nothing to do with the, it's an estimated 200 to $300 billion uh, that we uh, taxpayers in your country and here in my country uh, that's been invested uh, in this uh, proxy war uh, in Ukraine against Russia 
It's really a U.S., NATO, Ukrainian oligarchs war on Russia and their uh, geopolitical interests. What's going to happen in the next 45 days? Is this the closest we've ever been to a nuclear um, showdown? Some would say a nuclear, then with the H word, holla rhymes with boss. Again, all these words are are censored. So uh, we, we can't, we're not even supposed to say Israel a lot of times. We have to say the blue and white country. Uh, we have to learn from young people on TikTok. If you listen to Eddie and these young comrades uh, who I learned so much from, it's like the artful Dodger, the Charles Dickens character. When you speak publicly now on social media, the blue and white country, I, I don't know how to learn all these uh, things, but what's going to happen in the next um, 45 days? Uh, the We just saw the, the big headline here in, in New York City. We had this brazen assassination of the CEO of United Healthcare yesterday. It's not every day that a CEO, CEO is uh, assassinated. Um, they're just going to replace the CEO with the chief financial officer. It's not like some great victory for the masses, but it does make for a heck of a sensationalist uh, uh, headline. Trump has now survived uh, one assassination attempt and one that was uh, foiled. What What do you What do you think? Uh, we're not, you know, not not to make predictions which are impossible, but what could we see in this next forty five days of this lame duck presidency? You know, I don't really think of it as a lame duck presidency in the sense that, I mean, he, Joe Biden, wasn't in charge of anything at any time during his presidency, and he's not in charge of it now. The USA is firmly in the hands of its state machinery, the people that are not elected, who run things behind the scenes. And if no president was in the White House, <laughs> policy would continue to be enacted and the war would continue to be waged and, you know, profits would continue to go to Big Pharma and the health insurance industry. And, you know, um, I think that there's a little bit too much emphasis placed on who goes into the White House um, and it distracts people, you know, and it's meant to distract people from understanding that capitalism is a system, not a bunch of personalities. And it's a system whose state machinery is set up in such a way that you can't influence it through elections. Um, it is <clears throat> true that electoral politics in the United States is um, particularly fractious and polarized and polarizing. And but that's all part of creating this culture wars mentality that the ruling class really wants to push onto us whereby in on every issue we identify a section of the ruling class to ally ourselves with and spend most of our time hating the other side the other team's set of workers and it's a brilliant scam and they do it on everything and if you look at social media you'll see how um people's behavior in in how they frame their content and produce their content is really influenced by this polarization because if you play to the polarizing narratives you will go up the algorithms your your content will be promoted hence there are so many videos screaming um you know on on all kinds of issues you know whether it's trump or trans or whatever it might be that you have to have a screamy screamy way of presenting it and a very polarizing hate the enemy way of talking and presenting your content in order to get, to get clicks and likes, which of course everybody's chasing on social media. And they don't really understand that as they do that, not only is their content being shaped to fit uh, an agenda that's being imposed on them, but our mindset is also being very much encouraged to be entrenched in this football team mentality uh, of seeing the world that keeps us actually tied to a section of our ruling class rather than understanding that the people we're being encouraged to, to hate and blame are other workers. And the, the system is quite happy for us to carry on wasting our time and energy, shouting and screaming at each other across these fake dividing lines. So um, I, when it comes to this whole nuclear holocaust thing, I also think it's, I'm sorry, I think it's massively overblown. Um, yes, these are dangerous times, and they're dangerous times because imperialism 
the system of global imperialist capitalism is in its worst ever crisis of overproduction. It's a global crisis and it's fueling a desperation of the imperialist financiers, the monopoly capitalists, to maintain their hegemony in order to reboot their economies. They need to find markets, they need to create markets, they need to create demand in the system, which is full of utterly saturated markets. And the, so many financial institutions and so many markets are teetering on the brink of total meltdown, Danny. And we are all being made to look in other directions away from the fact that the financial world of imperialism is crumbling around the ears of the financiers and they are desperate to save it. That's why they're driving to war with Russia. They um, will do anything in their power to bring Russia down because they want to loot it. They want to loot it so they can reboot their economy and they want to then loot China the same way. And that means, you know, you have to take it on militarily, you have to defeat it. You want to, they want to break it into pieces so they can control the territory and the resources which are there, exploit the people, loot the resources. That's their aim. And they need to have a win. If they don't have a win, their whole system is coming down. They're in a massive, massive crisis. So we have to look at these things in context. So yes, they are dangerous, extremely dangerous uh, in their desperation. But, you know, I think when we look at the latest um, missile uh, attack from the Russians, the Ereshnik, the hazelnut missile, I love its name, the Ereshnik <laughs> missile that was demonstrated to us at the arms factory in Ukraine recently, what that showed us was, thank goodness, the Russians have been working out how to create a strategic missile that doesn't force you to go to nuclear war. And what they showed us is, if you keep crossing our red lines, we can take you out and you can't stop us. But it doesn't have to be nuclear holocaust, right? And I also think that there's, ever since Khrushchev, there's been this narrative that, oh my goodness, we can't allow ourselves to be in a situation where the imperialist and anti-imperialist camps go to war because it will be a war where the whole of humanity dies. And people are constantly screaming, that World War III equals nuclear holocaust, but it doesn't. World War III has already started. We are basically in it. It's escalating all the time, and there's going to come a tipping point where everybody can see, oh, yeah, we've, we've tipped over the edge now. It's definitely a global head-on conflict. But what, what are we seeing about this war, actually, which is spreading globally and which we do understand is fundamentally underpinned by the imperialist bloc's desperate desire to bring down Russia and China, um, it's characterized by proxy forces. And of course, one of the reasons for that is precisely to avoid a full on nuclear exchange of big nuclear weapons. But I do think, you know, we saw from Obama onwards that the, that the USA um, and because the USA is doing it, then the, 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 the countries that the USA wants to attack also have to do it to defend themselves. They've been focusing very much on producing what they call tactical nukes, small nuclear weapons that don't produce Armageddon, but are, you know, very effective uh, in a, you know, on a smaller scale. Of course, they will have radiation problems and all those things we know, which we already have, by the way, from their use of depleted uranium all over the planet. It's not like they've not been using nuclear weapons. As far as I'm concerned, they've been using them constantly since 1999. But... Um, they, I think, are looking for excuses to start using some of these tactical small nuclear weapons. And I do think it's possible that that will start to happen at some point soon without it being what people imagine as this, you know, the picture we've all had in our mind of World War Three, which is the whole planet disappears or all the people of the planet disappear, you know, in a, in a massive mushroom cloud. I, I think we haven't really uh, understood the nature of World War Three, and we're still living in the kind of propaganda Hollywood version of World War Three. Yeah, back in 2003 um, and in 2005, I remember September 24th, 2000 and was it three or 2005, we had 350,000 people march on the White House, on, on, on the Pentagon. There was this massive anti-war movement. And that September 24th call was uh, across the 
the, the, the West and across the world, but using these proxy forces and the way they're able to obfuscate the true purpose of capitalism. And if people don't have that anti-imperialist scientific analysis, they get so caught up. Yeah, but Assad is just so bad. And well, yeah, but the Chinese are this and that. Well, well, well in Zimbabwe, but look at Cuba and it is a dogged, dogged quest for every market uh, anywhere in the world that there's a worker state or any semblance of a worker state. It matters little the ideological hues or colorings. It, it, imperialism comes in with their battering rams and will do anything. I mean, that's, that's why they hate Assad. That's why they took out Gaddafi. That's why, when's the last time we heard one positive word about China? 1948, because they can't control China. So if this is not people's underlying analysis, they get caught up in the MSNBC and Wall Street Journal uh, headlines. So Lenin, uh, Lenin uh, broke down for us that foreign affairs are domestic affairs because they impact us all here at home. Uh, thanks to everybody for the comments that you're uh, putting up there. Uh, shout out to our uh, mutual comrade, uh, Garland. Uh, thank you uh, for the generosity. Um, thanks a lot, uh, Cobb fan. We have peace. I mean, what could be more important for, for peace? And we need more donations for peace so we can do more of this work and send more of our uh, young cadre to uh, Kenya and Algeria and to all these different international uh, conferences. Uh here we have Exodus, who I think poses the question, uh, well, um, question for Jyoti. What is your opinion on intersectionality as a means to create a false Marxism without teeth? Very well said. Revolutionary talk without the walk. I uh, met many young people who have fallen for this uh, farce. And I'll just preface this by saying I got a few uh, messages the other day from London and solidarity activists with the Kurdish people and the Zapatistas. And they were telling me that they really like my work, but that I have to remember that I'm cisgendered. They didn't remind me um, that I'm a worker. They didn't remind me of how I grew up with every obstacle known under capitalism, poverty. They reminded me that I must remember, like 99% of the working class, I'm cisgendered. What do these words even mean? Why are they there to, to divide us and distract us? This is a telenovela. This is a soap opera uh, that we get caught up in. The other number one headline that's distracting us right now, Supreme Court is now hearing a case from Tennessee, and it's the Biden administration, the Biden regime, saying that children should have access to, these are euphemisms, so everyone get ready, gender-affirming care. So I'm sure you could talk about this for the next two or three hours, Jyoti, but uh, I'll toss that back to you. It's a big topic and hard to do it justice in a pithy way. But fundamentally, I'm just going to do a little plug for my book here. I, I wrote a little, it's very small. I was, saving it, I was saving that for the end. You beat me to the punch, but take it away. Take you can do it, it again later. Um, so I wrote this little book, Identity Politics or Class Politics. I actually wrote it a few years ago, and then I was so, so busy, it never really got published. And then uh, recently I was like, mm, do, do we still need this? Or has this moment passed? And I was looking around, I was like, no, we still need this. Uh, but essentially what I tried to do in this pamphlet is to put – the um, transgender question and the transgender ideology um, into a context of the, the broader context of identity politics, which did not start with um, uh, gay liberation movement and the trans rights movement. It started um, with the women's movement and the anti-racist movement and the subversion of those movements into identity politics away from class politics. And the reason that was important was because in reality, you can't fight racism without fighting imperialism. Racism serves imperialism. It's necessary to imperialism to justify its colonial activities and its uh, wars, aggressive wars abroad. You can only justify those if you've given yourself the right to run the rest of the world. And you can only justify that if you're better than everybody else, right? So racism uh, and 
uh, imperialism go hand in hand. They can't be separated. If you genuinely, genuinely want to rid the world of racism, you have to rid the world of imperialism. And it's a similar thing for the women's section, uh, question. If you genuinely want women to be fully emancipated socially and not to suffer extra layers of oppression in society. It's not a question of educating your menfolk to be nice, although, you know, there will be a bit of re-education required in the right conditions. But the truth is that women's oppression is a product of class society. It began when society separated into classes. There's a brilliant book on Engels that explains this all so beautifully, and I've just mangle it when I do it, but uh, you should read The Origin of the Family, Private Property in the State by Friedrich Engels to really understand this question. Um, and then you can't be messed around with anymore by all the rubbish that comes out of the bourgeois feminist world to fully emancipate women and create a genuinely level playing field in society. What we need to do is abolish class society, which means that the question of women's liberation is a class question because it's the same struggle that all workers are fighting and all oppressed nations are fighting. We need to get rid of capitalism. We need to move to socialism. That's the only way to solve these problems. And for that reason, the question of anti-racism, the question of opposing um, uh, the suppression of other nations and the question of women's liberation are central parts of the Marxist working class program our program, our revolutionary program for bringing the masses together and fighting for socialism, because these are questions that can't be solved outside of that fight. We need socialism to get rid of racism. We need socialism to get rid of women's oppression. So these are class questions. Now, what the bourgeoisie did in the 1960s was bring along this thing called gay liberation. And they found, they, they modeled their idea of gay, a gay liberation movement on the women's movement and made it look like it was the same thing. But the thing is, it's not the same thing. You can solve the problem of prejudice against homosexuals in society without threatening the economic base of society. And we've seen that, in fact, the ruling class has now decided to do that. Why? They've solved their gay problem in the sense of, you know, abolishing all of the legal uh, and social kind of uh, norms that that meant that uh, gay people suffered systemic prejudice in this society. And it didn't change capitalism or imperialism one tiny bit, right? But it enabled the capitalists to present themselves to the people of the world like they're the defenders and champions of human rights, right? And then they go around the world lecturing all the people who haven't given rights to gay people to get married or adopt children or whatever the thing might be, um, and say, if you haven't done these things, you're backward, not like us, and we have the right to wage war on you. Don't we see pinkwashing of fascist Israel and homophobia bashing of anti-imperialist Iran on this basis with the West holding itself up as the champion of rights? It's precisely because it has it has done a kind of sleight of hand about what questions really require social emancipation and which ones don't some prejudices in society you can you can solve those contradictions without changing capitalism and because you can do that they're not central questions for marxists that doesn't mean we're in favor of people you know being prejudiced against against one another there's no point but they're not class questions they're not central to our program they don't affect the struggle for socialism which is what we're here for we are here to organize and unite the mass of the working class in order to struggle for socialism. And in working together, we will learn to get over all kinds of prejudices that we might have against one another for all kinds of reasons. Um, but it doesn't need to be part of our program to list all of the ways in which we might have different prejudices. They're not part of the struggle for socialism. That's just part of being human being. Right. It's a different thing. And the people are being very confused about all of this. Now, the trans question, I actually <laughs> to me, it's the absurd apotheosis of identity politics. It's like the, the, the top of the tree. You know, the women's question was turned into a into by the bourgeoisie into bourgeois feminism, which pits men against women. And then it became 
it stopped being a, a mass movement and became an academic discipline, women's studies, right? And it's a, it's a, it's a bourgeois, petty bourgeois, you know, struggling against the glass ceiling to get more women CEOs and more women presenters on TV and all this kind of crap. Nothing to do with what will liberate the mass of working class women. We see the same with the anti-racist struggle, disconnected from its real content, which is an anti-imperialist struggle, and turned into a question of prejudice, white, and, and it's black people versus white people. Brilliant. So black workers and white workers are told you're each other's enemy, and it's intrinsic. It's, it's born into you. you got, you're born with this pigment, and whatever your pigment is, that shows how oppressed you are, right? It's a ridiculous, as soon as you stop and think about it, it's totally ridiculous, right? But they, they, this bourgeois nationalism, black nationalism, all black people are a nation. That's something you hear. You hear it in the States a lot. It's a crazy thing to say. I advise anybody who doesn't understand what a nation is to read Joseph Stalin on the national question. He lays it out perfectly. And that is the basis for all Marxists who want to understand the national question. That's the, that's the place you have to start from. It was on the basis of that work that Stalin did in, I think, 1912. Um, under the guidance of Lenin um, to explain the national question and what define what is a nation and how we approach as Marxists the national question. It was on the basis of that work that Stalin was then put in charge of uh, the commiss uh, nations and he was the commissar of nations in the new uh, Russian Soviet and then the USSR and the Soviet Union put that policy into effect brilliantly, which is why they got, managed to get rid of national antagonisms inside the Soviet Union, so amazingly for 70 years. But just to come back to the point about black nationalism, you know, the bourgeoisie has turned anti-racism into black people versus white people. Uh, and they encourage black people to feel that um, prejudice in white people is inherent and something that simply can't be done away with. And they also encourage black people to believe that their path to liberation is living in segregation you know, we must set up a black a black community where there's black businesses. So we have black exploiters instead of white ones, you know, and that doesn't abolish capitalism. It doesn't abolish the root causes of racism, um, but it keeps people busy fighting for a liberation that won't liberate them. Um, and really the whole, the trans thing has, has emerged out of this, you know, wash of um, identity politics. Um, in a very kind of specific way, and it, it makes a mockery of the existing bourgeois identity politics groups, because for them, the struggle is one that's inherent and you're born into it, right? So men versus women, and it's an irreconcilable host host uh, hostility, and men are just born to be enemies of women, and the same black versus white, and you're born into it, and you're, you're born each other's enemies. And then the trans thing comes along with this ideology pushing it, which says you are what you think you are, not what your physical makeup says you are, not what your biology says you are, not what material reality has made you, but what you think you are, what you would like to be. So suddenly men can identify as women. White people can identify as black or vice versa, you can identify as anything you like. And it is, I think, massively ironic that this apotheosis of identity politics uh, where everybody is just their own individual group. I mean, they're constantly inventing new genders, aren't they? Because they haven't invented enough of them to satisfy all of the feelings of all the individuals, right? And we're gonna all end up, there'll be a gender for every person on the planet you know, on the basis of which, you know, gender now seems to be described has has no basis in reality. We, it's turned into therapy, doesn't it? You know, how I feel about my life. Um, and material reality disappears. Now, of course, if you are a Marxist, this is an attack on the working class. Marxism is the liberation ideology of the proletariat, of the oppressed peoples. Marxism is dialectical and historical materialism. The basis of Marxist science is material reality. And once you have an ideology, if you accept an ideology that tells you material reality is not really the thing, the real, it's just how you feel, well, that is pure idealism, idealism philosophically, uh, as in 
what comes first? The world and my thoughts and feelings and sensations are a reflection of the world or the thought and the world is a reflection of my thoughts and feelings. That's idealism. That's what creates religion. That is um, the ideology which is exactly opposed to materialism. And materialism is uh, the basis of science and scientific progress. And it's the basis of scientific socialism. And scientific socialism is how the working class gets free and how we get to socialism. So it's not just a question of being nice to people or being nasty to people. When we say we oppose the ideology that's being pushed on us very forcibly by the ruling class through its state institutions and through its media, that we must accept that everybody has their own reality. Not everyone has their own experience of reality, but everyone has their own reality. We are being told we have to accept that and we have to say, no, we won't. And that's not about me hating anybody. That's about me defending reality in the interests of the working class and its liberation. So it's really important to understand that that context. And I think there's one other thing that we have to talk about when it comes to um, the transgender issue in our society today, which is that a tiny number of people who are genuinely born into sex, born with a chromosomal abnormality, born with a um, genital abnormality, which means that through their life, they might be uncomfortable about gender and they might, as they develop, find it difficult to identify with the gender that they've been brought up as, but, you know, for reasons of their hormones, you know, not acting in the in the same way as, as they do for 99.99% of people, right? Um, these are the real transgender people who have, as I'm always being told by people, they've always existed. They've always been transgender people, yes. Like they've always been people who were born with one arm. It's a it's a phenomenon in nature, you know, that there are always a tiny number of people, you know, who are afflicted with different types of abnormalities. And to have understanding for that, to have treatments for that is perfectly reasonable. But that's not what we're looking at. We're looking at the way those people have been used to justify a marketing campaign which is aimed at creating a market for those treatments. And the market for those treatments is being found amongst young, alienated people in the West, kids who are told when they hit puberty and their alienation goes through the roof because of social breakdown and all of the problems of Western society, the violence, the pornography, the terror of hitting puberty without the social support you need to get you through it, all of that chaos that happens in the mind of a young person, they are then being given this direct marketing campaign that tells them that their discomfort and pain is because they're in the wrong body and if they get themselves in the right body, they'll feel better. Number one, it's a lie. These treatments are not proven, they're not efficacious, they are experimental, and it's a mass experiment on young people that I think the world will look back at in horror, the same way we now look back in horror at lobotomies and at, you know, Goebbels, um, no, what was his name, sorry, uh, Dr. Mengele in the, in, the, um, in the camps, you know, these mass experimentations on vulnerable young people, and this automatic affirmation stance that all state bodies in the West have been told they have to take to young people who, who turn up and say, oh, I think I might be in the wrong body. You automatically have to agree with them. And, you know, if you take somebody like that to a gender specialist, they're not a neutral person who you can trust to have the best interests of that individual child to heart. They are people who've been paid and co-opted and propagandized by a marketing lobby that wants fodder that wants people who will come and buy its treatments. And so once you take a child to somebody like that, they're, they're on the conveyor belt. Nobody's taking care of the interest of that child. They're taking care of the profit margins of an industry which is growing and wants to grow more. And it's using our children to grow. And I think that's something really horrific, actually. It's a mass campaign of child abuse that needs to be pushed back against. And again, that is not 
anything to do with hating people. Um, that is to do with recognizing what's actually being done in front of us and caring as a parent and as a member of society, caring about our young people, we should be protecting them. You know, if a young person came to me saying they wanted these treatments, I would say to them, as an adult, my job is to protect you from making decisions when you're too young to understand the consequences and they're going to have lifelong repercussions. And that is something that all of this automatic affirmation does the exact opposite of. And none of these children who go through these treatments are being followed up afterwards. There's no studies being done to find out, did the treatment work? What's happened to that person? Do they Have they stopped being suicidal? Quite the reverse. I heard something recently that there was one study, you know, they're just starting to look into some of these questions, that the suicide rate amongst people post-treatment goes up instead of down. So what does that tell you? You know, they're using the fact that people are suicidal to say it's because they need the treatment. But it's like, no, you're preying on people who are suffering from a socially induced mental illness and telling them they'll feel better when they've had the treatments. But the fact is, you neither know nor care whether that's true. Brilliant, uh, brilliant. We'll pass it back to you for the last uh, word. Uh, but first, you know, I, I think this is just such a key comment from our, our comrade Leo. If they could, they would cancel Lenin, Marx, and Engels. And in a way, they already have. How many people that come out of this identity politics camp will just tell you straight up, why am I going to read some old dead white men? And that's their criteria for what knowledge can uh, get us closer to collective self uh, emancipation. Uh, thank you to uh, Leo for the super chat solidarity. When we get to a point where the working class is a dominant is dominant and everyone is good food, housing, education, security, work, dignity, passports, visas can travel the entire world are truly free. We talk about these other things until then we unite as workers. And I think that is uh, definitely the message. Um, Hopefully, U.S. Congress will invite Joe T. to uh, deliver a lecture on these topics so they can re-educate themselves uh, on so many of these issues from the uh, trans trend to Syria to, 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 to South Korea. I don't know if that invite from U.S. Congress will be forthcoming, but uh, this, this cancel culture stuff is crazy, too, even for broaching this subject, even for this coming up, like, organically, you know, and and... We, I think we're all really, again, indebted to the ideological work of the Communist Party of Great Britain, Marxism-Leninism, uh, Marxist-Leninist. Check out this uh, book. And there's another book as well uh, that, that really helped uh, me because I come out of the left. I'm not ashamed to say that uh, you know I ate a lot of this stuff uh, hook, line, and, and sinker. A uh, book, Identity Politics and the Transgender Trend, Where is LGBT Ideology Taking Us? And what, what the comrades did uh, over there uh, across the pond, um, I think is an example for um, communists and internationalists and anti-imperialists and class-minded people around the world. They didn't measure whether they were going to be popular. They didn't measure the risk to themselves. They put out an ideologically steeled book following the science because they're loyal to Marxism, Leninism, they're loyal to humanity and humanity's 8 billion people uh, come what may uh, with this liberal cancel culture. Um, you know, and we don't know even for touching this, this, this subject, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll get harassed and attacked. And for me, when, when these liberal forces hide behind this hysteria and just for having an honest, Everyone thinks this. Liberals are just so afraid to even touch it. If you talk to liberals for the last 14, 15 months of GSA, of a big H word, holla, <clears throat> liberals will tell you, well, you know, I have a co-worker, I have a friend, and, and, and she's Jewish, and er, er, er. oh yeah, so look the other way against the extermination of a people. That's a great human strategy. Have we seen one liberal stand up? Now, conservatives, it, 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 it almost goes without saying. Have we seen one? Con the, the conservatives are weaponizing this whole anti-Semitism question to, to, to justify the military-industrial complex and the expansion of... So two sides of the same coin. Jody Bra, last words. Anything you want to plug? Where can 
uh, uh, we're approaching about a thousand people listening in live. Uh, where do you want to direct them so they can continue to follow the work of the comrades uh, over there? Thank you so much, Danny. You know, what you said there about being faithful to the science is exactly what our party does. And for us, it's a no brainer. We know that with a correct program, you might not win. But with the wrong program, you definitely will lose. Right? All of the history of class struggle has shown us that. And we are not communists of the type who want to put on a pair, you know, the right uniform and pose around in the streets. We are genuine class warriors in that we understand that Marxism is our liberation ideology and our job is to master it and to connect it to the masses who are going to be the ones who will use it, right? But you can't connect it to people if you haven't understood it and you can't connect it to people if you're constantly changing it in ways that you think will make it more acceptable. And particularly when you understand that making something acceptable basically means pandering to bourgeois propaganda and bourgeois prejudice. And our whole job is to expose bourgeois, bourgeois prejudice and help people see how they're being manipulated and why and show them you know, what the path is to uniting and getting themselves free. So there's no point, as far as we're concerned, doing something that you think is a shortcut to getting big. If in the process of getting big, you threw away the whole essence of what's the point of what you're trying to do. You know, so we we remain frustratingly small. One of the reasons is, of course, exactly what Danny was talking about, this algorithm suppression. We're not just shunned by the official left in Britain who are all liberals and hate us for the reasons you can imagine, because we're actually anti-imperialist. Um, but we are, there's a blanket ban on mentioning our name in the mainstream media. And in the social media algorithms, we are totally suppressed, shadow banned and all the rest of it. At a meeting, we, we had a booklet launch just at the weekend. And at that meeting, one of our new members who runs also runs a podcast said um, during the Q&A session, she said, on my podcast, I can add tags on anything I want to to an episode. She said, but if I try to tag the party, the software freezes, won't let me do it, right? This is not accidental. We are deliberately and carefully and systematically targeted precisely because we work really hard to bring the truth to people and we don't wrap it up in you know presentable, acceptable uh, to the ruling class ways. We don't, um, we don't, change our politics to fit with what's fashionable or what's in the bourgeois agenda. We do our best not to chase the news narratives. We really try to look for what is what is actually important and why. And when these topics come into our party, we look at them um, properly and analyze them before we come out with a, with a view on them. And when we have come to a view, then that's our policy and we'll explain it to the world and, and why we've come to that. And as you said, you know, it it it's not always popular straight away, but over time, people will respect that, that that's what you did. And they will come around to the fact that you've been telling them the truth all along. And life teaches people that after a while, you know, things they didn't want to be true initially. After a few years, they come back to your door and say, oh, I've just realized. Um, and we do have a you know steady trickle of those people who've come through the whole world of oppression hierarchies, you know, and who's who's the most um, miserable because of the pigment of their skin or because of their gender or because of their sexuality or whatever, you know, they've, they've come through that world and come out the other side and said, you know, the CPGBML were right, were right all along. Um, I should have, uh, wish I'd have listened to you earlier. But, you know, sometimes you've just got to learn from your own life experience about those things. And just what you were saying about Marx, I think it's really important when you come back again to this question of science, um, science belongs to humanity. Marxism is the highest achievement of human science to date. And until such time as we have a socialist society that uses the Marxist approach to every area of knowledge, um, Marxism will continue to be the highest achievement because Marx's, Marx's discovery of dialectical and historical materialism, his discovery that this method can be applied in every sphere of knowledge and it will massively unleash our ability to understand the world, understand its laws and make sense of them. And that's in the natural world as well as in the social world. 
These are huge and groundbreaking discoveries that the ruling class is sitting on because it's inconvenient to bourgeois rule to recognize just how groundbreaking Marxism is as a science. And that's why they don't even tell you that it's a science. They act like it's just some thoughts of some bloke a long time ago, some, you know, in Germany or London or wherever they want to say he was from. But the reality is it's like saying, you know, the law of gravity is irrelevant to you because it's, you know, it was discovered by some, it was just the thought of some white guy in Europe, you know, 400 years ago. Why would you pay any attention to that, people? But, you know, if you're involved in physics, then the law of gravity is one of your foundational pieces of knowledge you need to work with, just like the, you know, what was discovered by um, uh, Albert Einstein, you know, lays on top of that. Now, these are not the thoughts, the random ideas of those people. They are discoveries of science, of laws, of objective laws of how matter in motion behaves. And that's also what Marxism is, consists of a whole load of discoveries of laws of how motion and matter behaves. And uh, matter in motion, sorry, uh, yeah, up to, upside down. So to, to understand that, that instantly gets you over this idea that it's like white or European or Eurocentric. You know, the ruling class constantly pushes these ideas on people because they don't want us to pick up Marxism and take it as our own and use it. So they give us reasons not to. Oh, it's written by a bloke, so it's not relevant to women. It's written by a European. It's not relevant to anyone in the rest of the world. It's written a long time ago, so it's not relevant to young people. You know, they're brilliant at selling this nonsense to us. But if you understand, no, it's science. <laughs> and it's it belongs to humanity then you can really get over this this type of silliness uh and just finally you know if my dad likes to say Hopal Bra is my father and people may know him or may not but he's a quite a great Marxist uh himself and the founder of our party and he used to say you know um if Marxism was really dead why is it that the bourgeoisie gets up every day with a spade and starts burying it again we don't have to bury what already died. And yet every single day, the ruling class is looking for ways to bury Marxism again. And I think that's a really, you know, it's a really good thing to remember. You can't bury Marxism while there's such a thing as capitalism, while there's such a thing as the working class. You know, if there's a working class, there will be Marxism. And if there's capitalism, there'll be a working class. So, you know, you, there is no burying Marxism. It, it will remain relevant until and after we have our liberation. Um, just if you want to catch up with me, you can find me, uh, Jyoti Bra, on Telegram. That's my preferred social media. I am on Twitter, but... I prefer, I prefer Telegram. Um, and my party, The Communists, um, is also on Telegram. Thecommunists.org is our website. Um, and it's a, there's a lot of fantastic analysis there. And on um, YouTube, we have a, a channel called Proletarian TV. Beautiful. Amazing. Um, just one book in case anyone wants to read uh, deeper on all of these uh, questions. This is a psychiatrist, Dr. Miriam Grossman, Lost in Translation, a Child Psychiatrist Guide Out of the Madness. Uh, really a brilliant, brilliant uh, objective uh, view by this medical professional who is definitely not a communist, but on this uh, issue, I think brings up uh, all, all the different science. So uh, Jody Bra, ladies and gentlemen, sisters and brothers and friends and enemies, because we know there's also many ideological foes out there uh, watching as well, but there's only one enemy and that's a class enemy. And that's what uh, you know we believe here at Midwestern Marx and in the American Communist Party. We're not gonna be divided by these quote unquote Culture Wars. Uh, thanks so much, Jody. We'll be in touch. Thank you. I sure if Hazard is a hard man to be hard. Stand up, all victims of oppression, for the tyrants fear your mind. Don't cling so hard to your possessions For you have nothing if you have no right Let racist ignorance be ended For respect makes the empires fall Freedom is merely privilege extended Unless enjoyed by one and all So come brothers and sisters 
for the struggle carries on. The international unites the world in the song. So comrades, come rally, for this is the time and place. The international ideal unites the human race. Let no one build walls to divide us, walls of hatred and all walls of stone. Come greet the dawn and stand beside us, we'll live together or we'll die alone. In our world poisoned by exploitation, those who have taken now they must give. And end the vanity of nations, we've but one earth on which to live. So come brothers and sisters, for the struggle carries on. The international unites the world in the song. So comrades, come rally, for this is the time and place. The international ideal unites the human so begins the final drama in the streets and in the fields. We stand unbound before their armor. We defy their guns and shields. When we fight provoked by their aggression, let us be inspired by life and love. For though they offer us concessions, change will not come from Oh,